want to speak. I'm going to go ahead and call the meeting to order. I know we have some people still signing up on the sign-up sheet. I appreciate the uh, members of the committee being here and those in the, from the public. <clears throat> I want to talk about this, uh, the issue of uh, offshore drilling. I know it's an issue that's uh, it's important to all of us throughout the state. It's important to people throughout the country, but I know the people in, uh, a lot of people in coastal Georgia, it's a little bit different issue. And I'm sure even coastal Georgia people have different uh, different opinions about it. But it's been brought to my attention that uh, there's an interest there, and I asked to uh, have a some folks have asked to have a chance to to speak about it, express opinions, and that's what I want to uh, I want to try to give everybody as many people who want to say something about it. I want to try to give as many of those people an opportunity to do that as we can. So uh, we've only got actually got three. Uh, three speakers that have uh, signed up to be uh, to to present, but we also have the sign up sheet there. And uh, here again, it's a hearing on this issue, and we're here to learn and hear from uh, hear from people from throughout the state. I don't know, uh, you know, I've got like I say three presenters. I don't know how long your presentations are. I think maybe uh, at least one of them has been indicated that'll be fairly short, but. Those who are presenting, if you'll just keep in mind that they're, how m do we take a look and see how many people are on the sign-up sheet down there? Okay, that's not that's not all that bad. So, but do keep that in mind as you're making your presentation. And uh, first of all, I'll call on, uh, and I know we have some reps from down that area too. Uh, in fact, would you all, would either of you like to say anything before we get started? I, uh, I signed a resolution against it. Oh, you signed a resolution against it? Okay. I'm here to listen and learn this morning. Okay, sounds good. So all right. I'm here to. Okay. I'm here to listen. Well, to listen, if you, if I, I didn't, but we are being uh, webcast, so if you have anything to say, if you would go to the mic, which you're welcome to do. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I represent uh, Camden County. It's a coastal county, the southernmost coastal county next to Florida. Obviously, uh, an issue like this is very impactful on the coast. Um, any offshore oil drilling that would be, be potential uh, into our part of the coast um, would obviously have to negotiate with Kings Bay Naval Base. So there are issues there that would have to be considered as well. Um, so while I think energy independence is something that I support and I do support an all the above energy strategy, uh, there are other things that we're going to have to look at as we move forward. So um, I do support the idea of looking to see what's there, um, but this is an issue that will be uh, looked at further out in the years uh, because of technology and the other policies going forward. So um, that's just all I wanted to say, Mr. Chairman, and I wanted to voice my, my interest in this topic today. All right. <coughs> appreciate you coming thank you so the first presenter is Doug Hamans uh, director I'll let you tell us who you are and who you're with be happy to sir 
And, and uh, so my name is Doug Hamans. I am the Director of Coastal Resources Division, Georgia Department of Natural Resources. I've been in that job since November the 16th. So anything I say that's wrong or out of place, I'm gonna use that in excuse and I'm gonna use it as long as you'll let me to. <laughs> Secondly, I would like to apologize to you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate you having us here. This is a new committee for us. Uh, typically we're game, fishing, parks, and natural resources and environment. So appreciate the opportunity to come before you guys and, and have a very brief conversation. Uh, and finally, um, I, I want to introduce to you Jill Andrews. Jill is the Chief of Coastal Management for us as well, and so a lot of the comments that I've put together that we have put together as a team. I'll say that we found out about this yesterday at about 11 o'clock. That's why I don't have a presentation, and I'm just going to have some very cursory remarks about the coast. Uh, first of all, the coast of Georgia is 103 miles long, 100, excuse me, 104 miles long, and within that 104 miles, there's uh, 14 barrier islands which protect 368,000 acres of marshes. Uh, there's 2,700 acre, um, excuse me, miles of tidal creeks uh, that 630,000 coastal residents use for recreational commercial purposes. We work each and every day to maintain and protect those properties uh, through the Coastal Marshlands Protection Act, the Shore Protection Act, the Protection of Tidewaters Act, the Rite of Passage Act, the Coastal Marshlands Act and the Game and Fish Code. We do not work through the Georgia Oil, Gas and Deep Drilling Act. That is not in our wheelhouse. So my comments through the rest of this uh, couple of minutes are really just to our natural resources, but not to offshore drilling. Um, I will also say that we do all of that, uh, all of those acts and, and manage all of those properties with roughly a 70 to 30 split. The federal government pays approximately 70% of our budget each and every day. Uh, and all of those are state requirements that we fund through federal funding. So with that, there's an awful lot of natural resources on the coast that have uh, a lot of bearing on each and, each and every one of our lives. Starting with its further to this point, we, we look at things like groundwater. The Florida Aquifer extends 55 miles offshore. Uh, and that's been found over the last 30 years from drilling that they've done out there to this point. We have live bottom that's irreplaceable offshore, uh, Gray's Reef being the most well-known piece of live bottom, 17 square miles of, of carbonaceous uh, outcroppings. Our beaches, we'll talk about a little more in detail, but um, you know our beaches are popular tourism destinations. Uh, coastal tourism somewhere in the neighborhood of $2 billion. Um, and then our marshes, which we have protected since 1970 through the Coastal Marshlands Protection Act. Um, we have, by all accounts, roughly a third of all of the salt marshes along the east coast of the United States. But over the last decade, we've lost roughly a third of the biomass that's in those marshes due to drought. Um, so I'll say that to say that only that our marshes are stressed as they are today. We have an awful lot of biological resources in coastal Georgia, starting with, first and foremost, our threatened and endangered species, whether it be right whale, the most endangered of all of our marine mammals. Uh, I don't know if you've been following right whales in the papers here lately, but, but the Georgia Department of Natural Resources tracks right whales uh, each winter during calving season. And this is the first calving season where there have been no right whale calves spotted. And we just uh, are about to finish up our, our right whale surveys on March the 15th. Um, and there were dozens of right whales lost uh, in New England uh, for various entanglements of fishing gear. And so a population of 450 animals is pretty stressed as, as, as well. We also have the West Indian manatee, uh, short-nosed sturgeon, Atlantic sturgeon, and many other threatened and endangered species. Dozens of finfish species that we managed not only through the state of Georgia, but also the Atlantic States Marine Fisheries Commission and the South Atlantic Fishery Management Council to include redfish, spotted sea trout, southern flounder, weak fish, uh, red snapper, black sea bass, red porgy, and the list goes on and on. You know, one of the crucial things that Georgia, one of the crucial ways that we manage those uh, is through the use of artificial reefs. If you know anything about Georgia geomorphology, we are a sand shelf from the beach. If you, if you stand on a Georgia beach and look 50 miles eastward, the beach is pretty much like that all the way to the continental shelf. And so we put artificial reefs out there. We've, we've currently got 30 permanent reefs, 22 actively that we're placing materials on in order to create habitat uh, for those fish species that we just talked about. Um, 
And, and then we have our shellfish industry. Shellfishing is coming on strong in Georgia, both oysters and clams and mussels. Um, and, and all of those species are at risk if we don't manage them correctly through the acts that we've been given. And just in closing, I'll say, you know, you're going to hear uh, in, a, in a moment from representatives of the indus energy industry uh, and others. We've been working with the previous Bureau of Land Management and now the, the BOEM for over 30 years in providing comments to various exploration and leasing programs. Uh, BOEM has been very responsive as of late, uh, especially since uh, early 2000s, in responding to state concerns. Things like uh, adding in uh, distances for, for uh, G and G surveying, the, the geological and geophysical surveying, distances of 20 miles, no, no closer than 20 miles for turtle during turtle season or 30 miles during right whale calving season. So they've been very responsive to that sort of request. And we believe uh, that they will continue to be responsive to public input and public comment over time. Uh, in an effort to keep it brief, I'll close there. Uh, Jill and I will both be here through all the presentations if you have questions. But again, the natural resources are, are our wheelhouse, and we'll be happy to help where we can there. All right, thank you. Any uh, questions well, from members of the committee? Thank you, sir. Appreciate well, it. Before we go on, I want to uh, make a little announcement here, I guess. <coughs> In this committee, I've never, we've never really established or enforced any kind of rules as far as, you know, I don't mind people having their, their cell phones on. I don't mind the, the ringers being on. I mean, to me, that's just a sign of people doing their jobs and uh, people you know, trying to uh, perform whatever service that they do, uh, commerce, industry, things like that. If there's no objection from the uh, committee uh, as far as uh, videoing, I will we'll allow that. I would say, however, that these meeting, this meeting is being uh, webcast and there is an archive of it that you can get off the, uh, the Georgia House of Representatives website. So anything that's said in here is, is, uh, is public and it is available. You don't, you don't have to use your video. Is there objection to allowing that the video to be taken? I would ask you that you might consider because it might put some people, you know, ELDs when they're when they're speaking. It's all available anyway, so you, you don't have to. But I would ask you just to consider it. I'm not going to ask you to not do it. Uh, Hunter Hopkins. If you'll tell Sorry, good day. Good afternoon. I'm Hunter Hopkins. I'm the executive director of the Georgia Petroleum Council, which is a state division of the American Petroleum Institute. We are the trade association, the national trade association for the oil and natural gas industry. We uh, represent over 600 members. Uh, worldwide that do anything from exploring, drilling, extracting, refining, you know, all the way from uh, pretty much from the ground to the consumer. So appreciate y'all letting me be here. I've got a lot of information to cover. Uh, so just bear with me. I'll try to get through this uh, as soon as as quick as we can. And if you have any questions, please feel free to uh, stop me. Uh, American, the world of fuel by oil and natural gas. This chart here just kind of shows you a breakdown. You can see oil in the bottom of the red. Right now, we represent about 36% of the energy used here in the U.S. Going forward up to uh, 2040, we're expecting actually the use of oil to technically decrease a little bit, but you can see the natural gas continues to increase. But the point I wanted to make is that in 2040, the U.S., just the U.S., is going to require 12% more energy than what we currently use right now. The next slide actually shows it more on a global scale. And going into 2040, it's estimated that the world will require 56% more energy than what we currently use, which, don't get me wrong, there's tons of uh, nuclear, renewables, you know, coal, but natural gas and fossil fuels and I mean, natural gas and oil and fossil fuels will continue to kind of carry that burden. Unfortunately, in our business, it takes a long time sometimes to develop our resources. So we have to start planning now, looking into the future. What's in a barrel of crude oil? And I didn't know how 
how educated y'all were, so I just wanted to kind of go over some of the basics. In a typical 42-gallon barrel of oil, we take 47% of it as gasoline, 23% of it is diesel fuel and heating oil, kerosene, uh, 10% is jet fuel. The other stuff is used for asphalt, liquid petroleum, and then the other byproducts. A lot of that stuff is what's uh, is like feedstock for plastics and all other synthetic fibers. Uh, you know, uh, there's just a whole, I think, 6,000 plus products that are made from oil that are all technically uh, oil-based products that people use on a regular basis. Here's a little picture that shows some of those. You can see anything from like Ziploc bags to your hair dryer to an umbrella to a soccer ball. Uh, here's another example of the thousands of things found in everyone's homes that you use on a daily basis that you don't realize. As long as it's a synthetic fiber uh, or you know some type of plastic, all that is petroleum based. And here kind of brings it right to you with uh, just some of the stuff that we all use on a daily basis. You know, toothpaste your comb, shampoo, deodorant, perfume, lipstick, uh, you know, whatever it is. Uh, some of those things, they are, you know, some of them are all natural products, but it's usually packaged in a, uh, you know, a plastic container. So I just want to show you that just to say that oil is more than just fuel and energy. It's also used in a ton of other uh, different products. The United States is currently an energy superpower. This chart right here kind of shows the, uh, the natural gas marketed production, which is pretty much everything that we use, that we extract from the ground and put into the market. You can see how since about 2011, uh, since really since about 2010, it's kind of steadily climbed. But uh, once you hit 2014 on under 2016, you can kind of see where it really jumped up. A lot of that is due to uh, the process of hydraulic fracturing and horizontal drilling, which we're using a lot up in uh, – that's being used up in North Dakota and some er other areas around and they're really able to uh, tap into some resources that are you know literally two miles underground. Uh, in 2013 the world produced 121 trillion cubic feet of natural gas and that was the first year that the US became the leading natural gas producer in the world and over the past several years we've been the leading natural gas and oil producer in the world just to give you an idea of how much uh, our little energy renaissance that we've been experiencing over the f past few years has impacted uh, the world oil, oil and natural gas markets. Here's a chart showing U.S. crude oil production. You can see we peaked back in 1970, and the average uh, million barrels of oil per day that were, we were getting at was 5 million in 2008, and in 2015 that had jumped up to 9.4 million barrels of oil per day. And a lot of that, uh, as I mentioned, is just due to new technological advances, and uh, and we're actually going into wells in places that we thought were in th that were dry, but with the new technology, we're able to go in there and extract even more uh, in existing places. Uh, this chart kind of shows the blue is net imports of oil, the orange is uh, is oil production here domestically. Back in 2006, you can see that we were almost uh, importing twice as much oil as we were producing, but as uh, we've produced more oil here domestically, that's uh, cut down on the number of imports that we've had to have coming into the country. So it just kind of shows you that we're becoming a larger and larger player on the global oil market. Uh, U.S. offshore oil and natural gas production is vital to our economy. Uh, we have a thousands of people that work in our industry, and we pay very good wages, and we pay a lot of money. This chart right here shows... Uh, offshore oil production kind of as a percentage of total U.S. oil production. Now these are in, these numbers are in million, million per barrels per day. So in, two, in 2017, the U.S. Uh, the U.S. produced 9.32, actually no, I'm sorry, that I, I take that back. That's billion barrels per day. Uh, hang on, sorry. No, actually, it's uh, it's 9.32. That's 9.32 million barrels per day uh, in 2017, and offshore accounted for about 19 percent. That 1.73. That that just kind of shows you, as you can see, due to the uh, due to places like North Dakota and other places that are actually on ground, offshore is not producing as much oil as it used to. Uh, now we're moving on to kind of where we are right now with President Trump's new. 2019 to 2024 five-year offshore leasing program 
as you can see, 94%, pretty much everything in red right there is off limits to development. The uh, parts in blue, which are pretty much the Gulf of Mexico and a couple of slivers up in Alaska are currently the only, other, only areas that are open to uh, oil and natural gas development right now. And there are a couple places there in purple that are actually protected by a presidential moratorium. Now, under the previous administration, they did open up the, uh, the Atlantic Coast for seismic surveying. There were some, uh, uh, there were some permits uh, that were applied for. Uh, as Mr. Hamans mentioned, none of those have technically been granted, but they're just kind of out there in limbo. It's been over 30 years. I want to say it's, I think last time was like 82 or 83 since anybody has surveyed offshore for offshore off the Atlantic coast and Georgia coast for oil and natural gas. So I know it says up there there's 4.6 billion barrels estimated as well as 38.2 trillion cubic feet of natural gas. A lot of those are estimates because we, our technology, just like y'all have seen with, you know, smartphones and technology you might use in your work or on an everyday basis, our technology and the ability to map uh, what's under the, uh, the seafloor has really increased. So we can go in now and see a lot better and have a better idea of exactly what resources are, are under the ground. Uh, what is the process for expanding our opportunities? As I mentioned, uh, the Outer Continental Shelf Lands Act went into effect back in the 1950s. It pretty much says that the Department in, of the Interior controls any oil and gas exploration uh, in U.S. waters. Uh, they're collecting data. Right now we're reviewing a five-year leasing program, and then we move on through the lease sales and the regulations, and then we get to the point of uh, when the money starts pouring in from the, from the fossil fuels that are pulled from the, pulled from the ground. We're currently working on the 2019 to 2024 five-year offshore drilling draft proposed plan. If you look at this chart, it's we are technically in between the second and third box. We just finished a 60-day comment period. Now, uh, the BOEM, the Bureau of Ocean and Energy Management, was mentioned earlier. They're kind of the ones that put all this stuff together. And uh, they came out with this draft propo proposed plan they're offering 47 lease sales around the U.S., 25 out of the 26 planning areas. And they went around and they did a number of town halls. They actually had one here uh, down at the air, one of the hotels by the airport uh, on crossover day uh, is when that occurred. But they've been to uh, all over the place, all up and down the Atlantic coast and a number of other states to go th uh, where they came in with a number of their experts and people were able to go around each station and talk to them about all the different aspects of the, fi of the draft pro proposed plan. And then you could leave comments. And comment period ended on Friday at midnight. And I want to say they had, re they had uh, I saw online that they had received about 600,000 comments. Now, a lot of that's public notice. I personally haven't had the opportunity to go through and see who commented for it and who commented against it. But this whole process, that whole little green box takes about a year and a half to two years. So we're currently kind of in the middle of that. So what they'll do is that Boeing will come back with a kind of a newer draft, their proposed program, which could include the Atlantic. It might not. We just don't know. It's kind of up to them and based on the feedback they've received. And then we'll continue to kind of move down the process of uh, going towards the lease sales. Here's a little chart, a map from Boehm that kind of shows all the areas that are in play. Uh, you can see down there in the Gulf of Mexico, there are several new leases that they're offering. If you look over right off the Georgia coast, the South Atlantic uh, quadrant, they're, pr they're proposing a 2020 lease sale. If it remains on the books, we just don't know. But that's pretty much the U.S. or the continental U.S. And then there's Alaska, uh, you know, which is also included, which... You know, in the Gulf of Mexico and Alaska is the only other, the only places offshore where we're continuing, where we're currently uh, drilling for oil and natural gas. So that's just some maps, kind of more FYI. We have a very strong potential for the economic benefits if we decide to uh, drill off the Atlantic coast. Uh, based on some studies that we've done, job creation by, 20 th by 2035 could result in 280,000 additional jobs. Uh, you can see the other numbers, a $23 billion increase in GDP, uh, government, rev government revenue for of $51 billion, 
State government revenues would be $19 billion. That, all, that all that is not coming to Georgia, and a lot of that's also uh, has to be sorted out by the feds, you know, and, and then, uh, you know, split up among the states on where they end up drilling. Uh, here's just an idea, some of the jobs that we offer or some of our uh, salary numbers. You know, if for folks working out on the rigs or doing some of the drilling, their, you know, average pay of $150,000. Uh, the folks that are actually drilling it, doing the real grunt work, or doing, you know, getting paid about $90,000. Pipeline construction and other stuff like that. You know, we all pay extreme, our industry pays extremely well compared to other industries out there. Uh, here's a little number to show you that we aren't just talking about like white collar jobs either. The bulk of the job increase that we're expecting are going to be in unskilled, semi skilled, and skilled blue collar jobs. Now, the, uh, the blue is kind of where we currently is kind of a baseline, but the orange part of that chart is if we kind of keep, if we, a pro-growth strategy where we open up the Atlantic. But I just want to kind of give you an idea. It's hard to tell without knowing what resources we have off the coast, and if we ever decided to drill off the coast, it's really hard to tell what kind of benefit it might bring to the state. You know, it, we have no clue what uh, what's out there or what's accurately out there, so it's just really hard to put a number on the number of jobs that would come to the state or, or the amount of revenue. Uh, just want to talk about more about getting from where we are now to the actual point of uh, oil and natural gas production. This little chart pretty much shows the timeline and it also puts a little bit of a dollar uh, amount on it. We're currently up in the uh, up in that top part, really, we aren't even there yet because we're still going through the, the we're going through the uh, draft program. But when you start, you can see uh, it starts from minus three years, moving all the way up to the bottom, which is at about thirteen years. That's pretty much the timetable that it's going to take if the Atlantic coast is open for drilling and for uh, exploration it's pretty much going to be probably 13 to 20 years before you see any drilling activity occurring off the coast. And it's also going to go, it's also can cost up to $1.5 billion, up, upwards of $5 billion per well, just kind of depending on what it is. But there's a lot of work that goes into it. It's not just something that we aren't going to go out there. If, if, if the BOEM says, all right, we're going to do it, and y'all can start drilling off the coast of Tybee Island, we aren't going right out there tomorrow. I mean, it's literally probably going to be, you know, 18 years is kind of a good number that we use in the industry. So, and so just want to kind of show you that. Now, one way that we identify what resources lie underneath the seafloor is through the use of seismic surveying. And you can see the ship and that little red dot below it is the air gun that it shoots compressed air into the water. And those sound waves move down through the water into the rock formations of the seafloor, and they bounce back up into this long line of sensors that they drag behind the boat. And I mean, these things are usually like a quarter mile or half mile long and several hundred yards wide. And these ships cruise along, and they, uh, they fire the air guns. And those sound waves, as they bounce back off the rock formations and back up, and they are the sensors can pick up on them and all that data can be used to pretty much map what the rock formations are under the seafloor. Now, it has been 30 some odd years since anybody has been doing this type of seismic surveying off the Georgia coast. Uh, I like to tell everybody what we have now are current, our x-rays, but with the today's technology, we can literally give you the detail of an MRI or a CAT scan. You know, we can do 3D mapping and all that kind of stuff. Now, seismic surveying is also, is not just used for the oil and natural gas industry. The, the U.S. Geological Survey uses it. Uh, I know there are a number of beaches out there that go through regeneration programs, and the l federal government uses seismic surveying to go out and find sand deposits out in the ocean. Uh, a lot of these wind turbines that are being proposed along the coast, you know, though when you've got to put a three or two or 300, uh, foot high structure in the water, they have to make sure that they've got the, the type of rock underneath that's gonna hold that thing up. Now, a lot of those are not to the intensity that we use it for because we're trying to shoot those sound waves way down deep into the ground, but we are not the only people out there that use seismic surveying. Uh, 
here's just a list of some of the lease sales. These all took place in the Gulf of Mexico and one of them in Alaska. Just to kind of give you an idea of some of the money that's being spent by our industry. The last one in August of 2013, you know, $102 million. But then the one in March was $1.2 billion. So I'm using this to say that we use, our industry spends a lot of money sometimes not knowing exactly if we're even going to make all that money back. You know, we based on the data that we get from the surveying and what we think might be out there under the ground, we think it might produce that much oil or natural gas, but we really don't know until we drill it. So it's kind of a gamble for us sometimes. When we get when we do get to the point of uh, drilling, getting ready to drill for oil, I just want to throw you throw out some of the different uh, models of production platforms that we use. Now, the deeper the water. Uh, the different the platform as you can see the two on the left are kind of they're in a little bit shallower water so they actually have structures the ones to the far to the right have actual cables that uh, anchor it down in place to the ground uh, as you get a little bit deeper in the water some of them are even just suspended or even a ship sitting at the top that's uh, just tied to uh, everything on the on the seafloor via pipes uh, here's another one called the jack up rig Here's another one called a semi-submersible rig. Now that rig right there technically has a lot of motors on the bottom of its pylons on its four corners and they, you know, they kind of move it around to keep it in place. It's technically the only thing holding it to the ground is the actual drill pipe going down. And then the drilling ship, which not knowing at the moment, but from talking to some folks, some of my members, a lot of folks think that this would probably be if we were able, ever to drill off the coast of Georgia that more than likely would be a drilling ship that would do that, which that thing's only, I think it's 300 feet high and about 600 feet long, so it's not like there'd be a giant, uh, it's not like there'd be a giant uh, oil rig off the coast. And also where we're talking about drilling, uh, the most ideal place is the Outer Continental Shelf, which is, you know, 50 to 60 miles off the coast. Uh, and I don't know anybody that's got a building that tall that you could see that little boat or an oil rig from the coast. Uh, and plus, by the by, moving so far out, you kind of get away from all the shipping lanes, the commercial fishing zones, uh, the right whale habitat, and stuff like that. Uh, these are some of the subsea production systems. Just kind of give you an idea. There's a bunch of pipes and uh, motors and stuff down there that kind of uh, you know all kind of work together as we're extracting the oil and natural gas from the seafloor. Uh, this is gives you an idea of the, some of the royalties that we pay. Our industry pays. In 2012, there on the bottom, the oil industry, we paid over $5.2 billion to the government in, in royalties. Natural gas paid $483.6 million. And in rentals, because we do technically have to lease the property from the federal government, we paid $228 million. Just to give you an idea of some of the costs that go into uh, producing the oil that we use, you know, the gasoline that we use for our cars and all the other products that we use on a daily basis. Uh, we have a very strong system for safety and environmental protection in place. A lot of this, a lot of changes have occurred in our industry since 2010 uh, with the uh, BP oil spill in the Gulf. There's been a number of, uh, a number of uh, regulations that have been passed not, not only by the federal government and other regulatory bodies, but also by the, uh, by the industry itself. Uh, this is kind of our little motto, prevention, intervention, and response. Uh, the Bureau of Safety and Environmental Enforcement, which is part of BOEM, uh, they kind of handle most of our government regulations. And you can see some of these new uh, drilling safety rules that have gone in place uh, that just list, you know, everything. Because we, we learned a lot from that spill, and it was an awful event. And if uh, some things had been done right, we think it could have never spilled, but it was a horrible disaster. We certainly don't want to see anything like that. Uh, go again so we've done a lot of stuff through the f federal government United States Coast Guard uh, has a number of different uh, rules and regulations and the a MODU if you're if you're wondering is a mobile offshore drilling unit it's kind of some of those floating uh, floating platforms and the safety and environment and environmental management systems on board uh, they've done a lot of stuff like that we cr the industry created the Center for Offshore Safety and our mission is to promote the highest level of safety for offshore drilling com completions and operations by effective leadership, communication, teamwork, utilization, discipline, safety management systems, and independent third-party auditing and certification. 
Now, that's something that we did as an industry on top of everything else that the federal government has been doing. Uh, here's a list of some of our industry standards that uh, most of these are, are fairly new or post-2010. Uh, I can't, I'm, my eyesight's not that good to read that big list. And here's some more industry standards just to kind of give you an idea of, uh, you know, we've addressed stuff dealing with the blowout prevention, deep water well design, and all that kind of stuff in hopes that we would never see any tragedy like uh, what happened in 2010. Uh, part of all this, or part of the safety and trying to prevent some of this stuff also is some new kind of drilling, not really drilling techniques, but extraction techniques. If you see that large uh, object, it's a blowout preventer. That's kind of what, on the deep water horizon spill, that's kind of what gave way, that and the concrete kind of down below it. But what we started doing is we started putting in several of these other systems along these new wells that we're drilling to, if something happens with a blowout preventer, those other pieces of uh, machinery can help, uh, you know, can help, uh, help take the oil and pump it up to ships it, where it can be uh, salvaged and not spread and all that kind of stuff. Uh, oil spill preparedness and response. We have a number of oil spill response organizations. They've come up with new plans, uh, you know, new disbursements and stuff like that and new just uh, continued training in case something like that ever happens again. And, uh, and lastly, U.S. oil and natural gas production strengthen our national security. Uh, you know, for years, uh, we have, you know, any political unrest over in the Middle East or in Europe or wherever else, you know, where major, uh, a lot of oil is produced, you know, has an effect on us and our prices. As we've produced a lot of oil and natural gas here the last few years, some of the political unrest really hasn't had that much of an effect on us just because, uh, you know, every we're producing so much here in the United States. But... General Martin Dempsey, who's the former chairman of the Joint Chief of Staff uh, under President Obama, said that an, ener in, an energy-independent U.S. and net exporter of energy as a nation has the potential to change the security environment around the world, <coughs> notably in Europe and in the Middle East. And so as we look into the future, we've got to pay more attention to domestic production to make sure that we can uh, kind of insulate ourselves from some of the political unrest. And lastly... Uh, there, because Representative Spencer mentioned it with Kings Bay, there's a ton of military uh, operations in the Gulf. This just kind of shows you a uh, uh, report that we did back almost, ten, uh, I guess, nine years ago, talking about the coexistence of military and oil and gas. And there, we work very closely with the Department of Defense. And the last thing that we want to do is, you know, interfere in any way with uh, protection of our country. So uh, it's possible for us to, for the oil and natural gas industry to coexist with the military offshore, as well as fishing and tourism. Uh, I don't know if y'all have ever been fishing down in the Gulf of Mexico, but a number of those guys just take you out to an oil rig and you go catching red snapper and all kinds of fish off the oil rigs. So it is, uh, it is possible. We're doing our best as an industry to make sure that, uh, you know, the environment and the coastlines and everything are, uh, are sustained and protected and uh, you know are hoping that the uh, current federal administration would possibly at least give us the opportunity to go out there and look because like I said it's been for almost 35 40 years since anybody has looked off the Georgia coast and there might be something there might not I know there were some exploratory wells that were dug back in uh, I believe 50s or 60s and they didn't find anything I think there were seven or eight of them so I appreciate the opportunity, and I'm available for any questions. Thank, Thank you, you, Mr. Uh, Hopkins. Appreciate it very much. Great presentation, very informative, uh, and that's what we're here for is to learn. Appreciate the presentation. I don't see any questions. Thank right. you, sir. Thank appreciate you. Appreciate it. We have another presenter, um, and ma'am, you'll have to uh, – I'm not sure how to pronounce your last name. I'm sorry. It looks like it's French, I believe. I'm not very good in French. You're not German, the first person who ever else. said that to me. Uh, let me – if and you you're just oh. minimize it, it's pulled up, okay. Uh, my name is Megan DeRosiers, and I am the executive director of a coastal conservation organization in Georgia called 100 Miles. Is that, are you going to change that to 104 miles? We heard yeah, testimony. I know, probably actually need to. Okay. Thanks, Doug. You just made my job a lot harder. Thank you. 
thank you so much for having me, me here today and all of us here today. It's such an important topic, and I'm really grateful that this committee is willing to consider the impacts that offshore drilling may have to our coast. I just listened to Mr. Hopkins' um, presentation, just like you all did, and I think that we all have one thing in common in this room, and that is that we all know that we need petroleum. It's something we use every day. We need oil. It keeps our, as you heard, it's fuel for our vehicles, but it's also, uh, you know, I have a tube of toothpaste in my coat pocket. It's in that tube of toothpaste. So we, there's no question about it that, that petroleum and oil are fuel for our lives. Um, and we need it in this country. But the other thing that um, we didn't really talk about so much is that the U.S. has a lot of oil. Um, <laughs> a lot. And um, I in the U.S., we <laughs> import about 25% of the petroleum that we use, and we also but we also export petroleum. According to the U.S. Energy Information Administration, in 2016, the U.S. petroleum exports averaged about 5.2 million barrels per day. So that's 5.2 million barrels per day more than we imported. So that means we are a net exporter of petroleum. So when we talk about um, becoming energy independent, we're really talking about producing oil so that we can export more oil, not necessarily so that we can use it more in this country. Also, the U.S. has the world's largest stockpile of emergency crude oil. This is known as the Strategic Petroleum Reserve. In fact, we have so much crude oil that in the 2018 budget recommended by both Congress and the President, it is proposed that we sell off nearly half of our petroleum reserves over the next 10 years. This move, some say, is because the reserve was created at a time when the U.S. was dependent on imported oil and we are not dependent any longer. So. We all know, as we've heard, that the federal government is developing a program to help meet U.S. energy demands with the oil and gas reserves potentially found offshore. Because we are a net exporter and because we are considering getting rid of our strategic petroleum reserve or part of it, part of our stockpile, it is safe to assume that any new oil discoveries would be used for export. Mr. Hopkins talked about the Outer Continental Shelf and where this oil drilling and exploration would occur. The Outer Continental Shelf Act lands, the Outer Continental Shelf Lands Act requires the federal government to develop a plan for managing ocean lands found in the Outer Continental Shelf. This is an illustration of that shelf. The areas broken into the planning areas of the map that you saw earlier, um, and then they are leased to private companies for oil and gas development. These federally managed lands range from 3 miles to 230 miles offshore. The current draft program proposes opening 90% of federal offshore lands for leasing and energy development. This is the slide of the planning areas that you saw earlier. Georgia lies in the South Atlantic planning area, which includes Georgia, South Carolina, and part of Florida. Planning for offshore drilling is complicated, but it's a three-step process. And so we're going to talk about those three major steps, which are exploration, which includes survey and testing, surveying and testing, lease sales for drilling, and extraction and production. There, um, exploration for oil, as you heard, it primarily involves the use of seismic air guns. This is an illustration similar to what Mr. Hopkins showed. There is a growing body of scientific evidence that reveals that Seismic testing is harmful, if not devastating, to marine life. This marine life ranges from the largest of mammals in the ocean to even some of the smallest of organisms in the ocean. For example, a study released just last year found that seismic surveys decimate all zooplankton within 1.2 kilometers of the point of discharge. So here's the study. I would like to submit it for the record, and I'll leave it here. Um, but let's talk about what zooplankton is. Zooplankton form the basis for the ocean food chain. Without zooplankton, there would be no food for finfish, crabs, and shellfish that we eat and that other marine predators depend on. These zooplankton, as I said, form the basis for the food chain, but also the basis for our commercial and recreation fishing economy. 
Another major impact to marine life is the impact of increased ocean noise on the endangered North Atlantic right whale, Georgia's state marine mammal. This species cannot withstand any more threats. Last year, we lost 18 right whales due to ship strikes and entanglements. As Mr. Heyman said, there are only 450 of these whales left in the world, and scientists have documented a decline in the abundance of the species, meaning they are dying faster than they are reproducing. We cannot allow unnecessary marine disturbances to lead to the extinction of this amazing mammal species. And for what? All of the information that would be captured by seismic surveying companies would be kept private. It is proprietary, so not even the federal agencies would have access to the knowledge of what lies beneath the surface of our ocean floor. Second, let's move to extraction. The extraction of oil comes with some risk as well. If drilling were to become an industry in coastal Georgia, drilling rigs in the outer continental shelf would operate normally as they do in other areas where drilling is an everyday reality. This means constant ship and helicopter traffic to and from platforms. This translates to regular disturbance for those of us who depend on Georgia's pristine beaches for rest and retreat. And just like seismic data stays with private companies, coastal Georgians would be disrupted with very little benefit. We saw tables of uh, finance, financial information and um, economic information that Mr. Hopkins showed us. But revenues generated from offshore oil sales are not shared with states because the federal government has a prohibition against sharing drilling related royalties with affected states. But we, we can all remember when the extraction of oil and gas in our oceans has resulted in the loss of massive spills, as you heard, like the largest marine oil spill dr in drilling his history, when the BP Deepwater Horizon exploded in 2010 in the Gulf of Mexico. The BP oil spill was tragic, and I appreciate Mr. Hopkins mentioning that, but it's not the latest oil spill that we've had. Just in the past six months, serious environmental and safety violations have occurred in the oil industry. In February in the Gulf, an independent operator was killed doing a routine safety check. And in October, a spill in the Mississippi Canyon res released nearly 10,000 barrels of oil. This is the largest oil spill since the Deepwater Horizon event in 2010. So let's finally move to the processing of oil and the, pr the extraction and production. Processing oil involves construction of canals, pipelines, and refineries, all investments that quickly and sweepingly industrialize an area. Contrast these images of Galveston, Texas, and Louisiana with the image from the Georgia coast. The process is long and involves multiple levels of permitting. Over the past three years, the Federal Bureau of Ocean and Energy Management has released at least five draft and proposed programs to identify offshore lands to be leased to private companies for oil and gas development. Last Friday, March 9th, ended a public comment period on the latest proposed plan, as Mr. Hopkins mentioned. In the last four years, thousands of Georgians have engaged in this complicated process. Georgians have responded to the public comment period and submitted information and opinions for the feds to consider. As he said, a total of 617,000 comments were submitted electronically to the federal government in response to the proposed program to allow lease sales offshore on federal lands. The majority of these comments opposed the plan and questioned the validity of the proposal. I actually did look through them. Um, businesses and associations are joining in. I have copies of letters written to the governor from Southwire as well as professional associations that work throughout our 100-mile coast, including the South Atlantic Mani Fishery Management Council, um, the S Southern Shrimp Alliance, and the Gullah Geechee Fishing Association, just to name a few. And I will leave these with you all to review. Georgia citizens are also reaching out to Governor Deal, asking him to join his fellow governors and ask for an exemption from the plan for our state. Right now, all coastal governors have weighed in on the federal agency's plans for offshore drilling on the East Coast. Ev on the East Coast, every governor but Maine opposed the program, and the yellow indicates that our governor has not weighed in yet with either a for or against opinion. So we have been working with residents all over the coast to have them ask the governor to weigh in. So we have a petition here that we've had out in, sh in stores in coastal Georgia since January. 
and they're all hand signed signatures they're not electronic we have 975 signatures of coastal Georgia visitors and residents who are asking the governor to speak out in opposition we also have an electronic si petition which um, is also helpful but um, not like this where people actually um, talk to each other and um, and the electronic petition has 1400 signatures and I'll leave those with you as well <coughs> these and other actions have also resulted in the adoption of eight local resolutions Brunswick Hinesville Kingsland Savannah st. Mary's Tybee Island and a few inland towns in court including Porterdale and, re and, recent and recently the city of Atlanta have passed resolutions opposing offshore drilling. These resolutions represent 750,000 Georgians, and I have copies of all the resolutions as well. And I'll put them in the stack. Georgians are being heard here in the Capitol. I'm proud to say that our coastal delegation, both of senators and representatives, a bipartisan group, are listening to their constituents, and some are here today. House Resolutions 1041 and 706 are testaments to the local economies and natural systems on our coast that work for us and contribute to the state's economy. The proposed resolutions state clearly what our representatives know of their constituents, neighborhoods, and their hometowns. They state, Georgia's coast supports a significant fishing and tourism industry, which benefits the state economy in terms of 21,000 jobs and $1.1 billion of Georgia's gross domestic product. Georgia's coast supports military preparedness, training, and testing activities taking place off the coast of Georgia at Kings Bay Na Na Naval Submarine Base and the Naval Undersea Warfare Training Range, which is under construction. Georgia's coast contains 368,000 acres of marshland that provide essential nursery grounds for fish, shellfish, crab, and other marine life. And lastly, a healthy tourism industry and economy are vital to protect the public, health, safety, and welfare of Georgia's citizens. Coastal Georgia is, like, is unlike any other place on the planet, with some of the most extraordinary nature, communities, history, and wild places remaining on the eastern seaboard. And our legislative delegation representing our coast knows it. Exploration and drilling production offshore may, benefit, may produce some benefits for the community, as Mr. Hopkins testified. But we must carefully consider this. What are the benefits and are they worth the risks? So I'm here today to tell you about this industry, to share with you some pictures of the coast. It's hard to bring coastal Georgia to Atlanta. I did bring a couple of citizens with me. Actually, one flew up with me this morning because she heard about this. And I know we're not talking about HR 1041, but I s sincerely hope that at the after you hear what Mr. Hamans and I and others have to say about the resolution and about the impact that, that offshore drilling may have, I hope you will consider this resolution as it is a testament to the importance of our tourism economy and the threat that this industry may provide. Thousands of Georgians who have spoken out are the people who know the region best and the people who have the most to lose by opening our coast to drilling. Thank you so much for your willingness to learn more about this issue, and thank you for giving me so much time today. I'm happy to answer any questions. Looks like we do have a question. Representative Dickey, do you have a question? Okay. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, and, and you made a statement, uh, risk rewards. Um, and, and I think we, we are all pretty um, easy to assess the um, great, the great uh, um, things we have on our coast and in the state but how can you tell this committee how you assess the risks uh, evidently you've come to a conclusion but I'd, I'd like your uh, methodology on how you came to risk well I think we have to look at other areas where offshore drilling is present and what the impacts to the environment of those places have been and we can remember again the BP oil spill but Forget even a catastrophe. Just look at the landscapes of some of these areas, like Lu in Louisiana and like in Mississippi and like in Alaska. And I think we have to ask ourselves, is this really what we want to see for the future of our coast? That landscape change is a risk as well as a spill. But the landscape change is inevitable if we let this industry come in. A spill may or may not happen, but the landscape change is what we'll see. 
Okay, thank you. Uh, there is another question if you take it. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Ms. Megan, you had a slide up there where it reflects um, on both coasts, several states. The, if you can go back yeah, to that one. Yeah, I'll try and find it. Do you have, no, no, you just had it. Oh, sorry. This is the, this is the slide of governors. Right, yes, yes, okay. th that's okay. perfect. That's, okay. that's the one I'm referencing. Do you have the explanation from those states on why they're taking the stance that they are? I do. I brought South Carolina and North Carolina with me for you if you want it. Um, but, and they all vary, but right. for the most part, they are worried about the natural environment and the impact to the tourism economy. Yeah, Mr. Chairman, if I may recommend that we get um, those inputs, especially our neighbor states like Florida, in South Carolina uh, for this body. I'll, I'll leave South Carolina and North Carolina with you. I did not bring okay. Florida with me. Okay, sounds good. <coughs> All right, well, we uh, appreciate you very much coming today. We really do. Thank you for your uh, for your presentation. Very informative. Thank and, you. Uh, very meaningful. Sure thing. Appreciate it. Thank you. And I'm going to leave this here. All right, now we have a number, we have a number of people that have signed up to, that want to speak. Uh, and uh, to my knowledge, we don't have a we don't have a time to be out of here as far as the committee, as far as the room is concerned. I will mention to those who want to speak, uh, we want to hear from you. I'll be here as long as we have people who want to speak. Now, other committee members may have other commitments, and the longer you know, you'll, we'll lose more people from the committee. I can assure you of that as we go on. I do want to hear from you. I'll stay as long as. We have people that want to speak because um, you know, we all want to learn. We all want to hear. Uh, and my next uh, commitment is not until 6 o'clock, so I've got plenty of time. Some of the others may not be able to stay that long. Mm -hmm. So with that, uh, and I, I can't, do you, you know what that name is? <laughs> Deb. Deb, if you'll come and tell, you, tell us who you are and if you re represent anybody other than yourself. Okay. But I would ask you to keep it, you know, just keep it brief just I for am. the committee. Yes, okay. sir. I timed it. My name is Deb Luganbuehl, and that was Luganbuehl that probably tripped you up, that last name. So thank you, House Chairman Parsons, for the opportunity to speak today. And thank you to the Coastal Georgia delegation for co-sponsoring the uh, bipartisan HR 1041 resolution. My name is Deb Lukenbuehl, and I live on St. Simons Island. As Megan referenced, I flew up this morning because she told me about this hearing and the ob opportunity for public speaking, for public comment. So I flew up this morning and will fly back tonight. Um, I ask you to protect coastal Georgia and oppose offshore drilling and seismic testing. I am a, uh, I also serve on the board of the St. Simons Land Trust. So I am uh, very involved in our community and what our um, natural beauty lends to in terms of our tourism, et cetera. And I speak to you today about our coastal backyard, in particular the S Georgia salt marsh, which makes up a third of the entire Atlantic coast um, of all sal salt marsh. Twice a day we see surging tides, six to nine feet, which is the highest on the East Coast. I ask you now to imagine the beauty of our salt marshes, our 14 barrier islands, nine estuaries, and nearly 400,000 acres of salt marsh connect to the ocean and to each other. Thanks to public and private initiatives, all but three of our 14 barrier islands are preserved, which is almost unheard of. And um, benefiting from this healthy coast are shrimp, blue crabs, clams, oysters, all types of fin fish, birds, and other species that have been mentioned earlier, including the endangered right whale. Our coast is a stopover. Our Georgia coast is a stopover for thousands of birds who are journeying from their winter homes in Argentina or their summer homes in the Arctic. And that is incredible if you think about it, those little birds 
make their way, and some of them only just stop on St. Simons, or our coast, pardon me, our coast, to get their fuel um, so they can complete that journey. The majesty of our coast is also reflected in the economic impact of tourism, which has been um, estimated at nearly $2.4 billion, and that was in 2016, which generates nearly 21,000 jobs. Now, I know that is not um, quite maybe as impressive, but when you take in the, the coast and the residents that live there, 21,000 is quite a number for just tourism. So um, one thing I would like you to do right now, and I'm going to do something as a private citizen, I'm just going to ask you to imagine the natural beauty um, as seen by well-known Georgia poet Sidney Lanier. And um, some of you might have had this poem in your classes, uh, The Marshes of Glen. And he wrote it as he looked east from Brunswick, Georgia, uh, across the marsh to St. Simon's Island. His 1878 poem, so it was quite a while ago, was named after the county in which he lived and also the one I live in and, Br and Megan as well. It's a beautiful tribute to our coast, and I'm just going to end by reading two short stanzas. So, affable live oak, leaning low, thus with your favor, soft with a reverent hand, not lightly your person, lord of the land, bending your beauty aside with a step I stand on the firm packed sand, free by a world of marsh that borders a world of sea. And I would, I could know what swimmeth below when the tide comes in on the length and breadth of the marvelous marshes of Glen. And perhaps this will inspire you to take out your old school books or, you know, want, uh, search it on the internet and uh, read the entire poem because it's rather long. But I ask you to um, consider the uh, resolution as put forth by the bipartisan committee and delegation and um, think about the Georgia Coast residents who know and love that place and maybe we can bring a little of it up here. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you very much. Appreciate the, uh, the poem also. And uh, appreciate you coming up and come down there today. Uh, Neil Herring, are you here? Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. I appreciate this opportunity. I'm representing the Georgia chapter of the Sierra Club. Uh, the issue that uh, Representative Dickey raised, uh, the risk versus the benefits. Uh, one aspect of the oil industry, I, my father taught industrial arts in high school, and I grew up studying American industry. That was like in the house. And I've always been fascinated by industrial processes, and I the oil industry is one of them. And it's, it's, it's extremely interesting, as uh, Hunter showed. But the employment patterns in that industry are pretty interesting. It's a highly mobile workforce. And when they come, should they come to Georgia, if they come to Georgia, most of the skilled and semi-skilled workers are going to come with the industry. They're not going to train our local folks. They're going to be leaving other production fields and coming here. And so the impacts on the employment of native Georgians is probably not going to be as great as it would be if we had an existing petroleum infrastructure already. Uh, the other thing about the industry that I just reading about this week is uh, because of the safety concerns and the environmental concerns that Hunter mentioned, the industry is pouring a lot of research into automation. And they actually now have a robot roughneck to switch the pipes on the drill rigs. And, of course, that's the most dangerous, the highest risk job for the blue-collar people. But those could uh, very easily be automated. So that some of the benefits that would be possible were we to start production instantly tomorrow that would be here by the time the 18 years have elapsed, a lot of those jobs may have also gone away. And I just wanted you all to be aware of the evolving nature of the production. Thank you. Uh, Steve, is it Combs? Mr. Chairman, uh, members of the committee, thanks for having us. I represent, uh, my name is Steve Combs. I represent Surf Rider Foundation. 
Georgia chapter. Uh, our national organization has 80 chapters around the world. Um, our mission is the protection and enjoyment of oceans, waves, and beaches. So this issue hits uh, close to us. Uh, and for uh, uh, Representative Dickey had a question about the, the risk and the analysis that goes into that. I'd just like to make one comment about um, statistics that have shown um, even though oil and gas companies have claimed improvements in technology have greatly reduced the likelihood of a spill, uh, between 2006 and 2015, 389 oil spills have occurred from offshore continental shelf platforms and pipelines, and that does not count the associated vessels and barges um, that have tarnished our coastlines with approximately 206 million gallons of oil. So i also share a small anecdote. I grew up 20 years on the Gulf Coast of Florida, and we kept, uh, we went to the beach often, but we kept a gas can at the front of the garage so that when you walk, came home to the beach, you could get the tar off of your feet uh, that were, uh, so you didn't track it into the house. But we probably wouldn't use gas now, but there would be some <laughs> impact of, of offshore drilling in Georgia. Um, I'll mention also that we went through this process on the federal level um, previously, and it was determined that we would not drill in these areas. The prior studies and, and the pl uh, proposal was um, determined that we would protect the Atlantic, Pacific, Eastern Gulf, and Arctic Ocean. This new plan opens up everything. Um, and also, it contradicts the previous findings from BOEM, the scientific experts, the expressed wishes of a vast majority of the public to not drill. Um, and I'll also state that the, uh, the industries that rely upon this healthy marine ecosystem, including tourism, recreation, generate billions of dollars for coastal states and the nation as a whole. Um, we heard from uh, Mr. Hopkins that a lot of these benefits, economic benefits are unknown. Uh, they don't necessarily accrue to the state of Georgia. There are no royalties paid to the state of Georgia. Um, and yet we take the significant risk of the, as I stated, 389 oil spills, 206 million gallons of oil. Um, I'll talk specifically about Georgia briefly because a lot of the uh, in information from the petroleum industry was, was national. But uh, I'd like to state that the expansion of offshore oil drilling in areas adjacent to the state of Georgia and the surrounding waters present unique and specific risk. Uh, there have been some economic numbers uh, mentioned previously. I'll state them again because I think they're important. Um, 23,000 jobs um, threatened from our tourism industry, 1.3 billion in GDP in the state of Georgia for approximately one day's worth of oil and one day's worth of gas in these coastal areas. And those are statistics from um, Oceana and studies from that um, group. Um, even at the n for the entire Atlantic, we're speaking about um, meeting at national consumption rates today seven months for oil and less than six months for gas. So there's a very limited amount of, of oil and gas in these waters and we're taking significant risk. Um, other unique aspects we've talked about in Georgia, but I'll share additional information because I do think it's a very unique aspect of Georgia, is our unique tidal system. We've discussed the six to nine feet tides twice a day. Um, uh, we've talked about the uh, Gray's Reef being a uh, treasured resource. Um, that would be significantly impacted by seismic testing, even if they did not drill. The exploration activities alone would significantly impact uh, the uh, marine wildlife around Gray's Reef uh, Marine Sanctuary, also the, uh, n the Atlantic, North Atlantic right whales. Um, so in summary, I'd like to ask that we protect this Atlantic coast as, and um, that we oppose offshore drilling in Georgia. Thank you. I ha you have a question if you care to take it. Sure. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. You mentioned 389 oil spills. Mm -hmm. Can you give me the dates and the source that you're looking at? Because yeah. I enjoy looking at stats. Sure, it's 206. Uh, 2006 to? No, sorry, yeah, 2006 to 2015, 389 oil spills, 206.5 million gallons of oil. Okay. And the site is the up 2016 update of occurrence rates for offshore oil spills from BOEM and it's their Bureau of Safety and Environmental Enforcement. Okay. So it's the 2016 update from BOEM Safety. All right, thank All right. you. Thank you.
Representative, Representative Dickey, you have a question? Uh, thank you. I, I'm not going to ask a question, but if you would allow me to make a little statement. I, I know several folks have um, made comment about my risk reward. And I just want to make sure uh, this folks in the audience and, and really other members of the committee that know. I, I think it's up to this committee to for us to dig down. I, I don't think any of us want to hurt or, or any of our coastal resources. I love them. I'm, I'm going to be in St. Simons the week after this session ends. i got reservations. My favorite place in the whole world to go is lay on that beach and see those marshes. And I can't imagine ever building a refinery in those marshes or on St. Simon Islands. I'd be the first one down there to fight that type thing. But I think this committee and, I, I, and uh, uh, being a member, I, I'm looking uh, to see uh, from other areas of the country how, how you coexist, keep those great – uh, coastal resources we have, keep them intact, keep them growing and, and pristine, but also p the possibility of having uh, oil exploration out there. And so I, I, I think, that, and that's my point, I'm, I'm more business or in how do they both coexist or can they co, I guess the question is, can they coexist? And and so that that was my really question. I know they do in some in, in, uh, uh, areas of our country and areas of the world and, and, and I just, you know, I don't think anybody on this committee wants something or the governor wants anything that, that, that will harm our, our resources. Okay. But uh, that, that was my, my, my point That's of my question is, is everything we do have risk and reward. You know, every time we get on an airplane, uh, Representative Dixon, possibly that thing uh, going down. But, but, but we love to travel and, and get in a car and, and leave here. So I, I, I'm, okay. I'm sorry Thank I'm taking too oh, long. No, no, Thank no, you, Mr. Fine. Chairman. I, I, I'm loving but all the all the comments and, no. and the input. I think it's very important we hear all this, and, and I certainly uh, no. get a lot from it. No, I appreciate you. That's more of a statement than a question, though, right? Yeah. Okay, thank you. Appreciate it. Thanks, sir. Uh, Esther Stokes. And if you would, and uh, you know, I want everybody to speak and hear again. I'm going to be here, but just keep in mind that there may be commitments for other members. So. Uh, I promise I won't take long. Okay. Thank you. Good afternoon. <laughs> My name is Esther Stokes, and I am a resident of Atlanta, District 55. I am the current board chair of the Atlanta Audubon Society, and we thank all of the members of this committee for the work that you do um, for on behalf of the citizens of Georgia, and I appreciate the opportunity to speak today. Chairman Parsons, speaking for the 1,000-plus members of Atlanta Audubon, I, I urge the committee to take a vote on H.R. 1041, which supports Georgia's coastal tourism that we've heard about so much this afternoon and its fisheries and its recreation industries and also opposes seismic testing along with opposing oil and gas drilling activities off the Georgia coast. The legislators, the, the Georgia legislators along the coast on a bipartisan basis, as I understand it, are opposed to offshore oil drilling. Um, you may wonder why someone from Atlanta is speaking up on this issue, because obviously most of the people who are speaking here this afternoon are either represent the coast or they're from the coast or they have particular concerns on the coast. But the fact is that we as Atlantans are landlocked, so when we go to the coast, it's the best thing we've ever seen. It is our coast as fellow Georgians. It contains over a third, think about this, over a third of all the marshes on the East Coast are in Georgia. We have an extraordinary resource here that other states don't have. Other states may have started with having these resources, but they've lost them to development and to um, various pursuits that have sacrificed the marshland. The bird populations along the coast are huge. Both the resident populations and those, Deb mentioned, the migratory birds that 
use Georgia as a stopover. But offshore oil drilling could put all of those areas and birds at risk. Coastal tourism is a huge industry in Georgia enjoyed by Atlantans. Georgia's coastal economy is thriving, supporting so many industries. H.R. 1041 actually says it best, and I quote, Georgia's fishing and tourism industries and the state's economy are dependent on healthy natural environments and safe ocean systems along the Georgia coast. But offshore oil drilling comes with grave risks, as we know from recent catastrophic spills in the Gulf. Drilling has the potential to destroy the goose that laid the golden egg, our rare and beautiful coast full of fish, birds, the endangered right whales that have been referenced here today, sea turtles. And Megan mentioned the landscape changes, which I had not thought of, but obviously are a huge change for anything like this that would occur on the coast of Georgia. Seismic testing can harm our marine fisheries and marine mammals and threaten the survival of, I have the number 400 remaining right whales, somebody else said 450, but in any event, our, our state mammal is diminished hugely and any further negative impacts on that species could be devastating. So we ask that you schedule a vote on H.R. 1041. Give this committee the opportunity to speak on this issue and give the full house the opportunity to stand with our coastal communities in opposition to offshore oil drilling off the coast of Georgia. We owe it to the residents of our state to take a firm stand on this and we owe it to our children and grandchildren to conserve our amazing, astonishing coastline in its pristine state. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you very much. <coughs> Appreciate you coming. April Lipscomb. Is that April? Mr. Wait. Chairman, okay. um, she had to leave. I was going to say, you don't look like April. <laughs> I know. Uh, but she wanted to let us know that uh, the Georgia Water Coalition approved for us to be the support of the resolution and she wanted to go. Okay. All right. And I, well, I appreciate it. Here again, this is a hearing on the issue. It's not a hearing on any piece of legislation whatsoever, but I appreciate it. Uh, uh, Jeanette Gray Greyer. Good afternoon, committee. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, committee, for the op opportunity to speak today. Uh, my name is Jeanette Gare. I'm the Executive Director of Environment Georgia. We're a statewide organization that works to protect Georgia's air, water, and green spaces. And we're part of a national network. So there's an Environment Florida all the way up to an Environment Maine, which is relevant because we worked together with our sister organizations to sign businesses onto a letter uh, opposing offshore drilling and the recent plans for offshore drilling that were presented recently. I thought I would, um, I, I wanted to get some of those folks who signed on to that letter here in Georgia to come today, but um, none of them could make it because of the short notice and the long trip. But I wanted to read that letter um, and share it with you. So I'll read just an excerpt of it, um, not the whole thing. Um, as small business owners, stakeholders, and employees of the tourism industry along the Atlantic coast, we urge you to rescind all plans of offshore drilling off our shores. Our coast are lines with beaches visited by tens of millions annually, national wildlife refuges, parks, and sensitive marshes and bays. They support a robust fishing and tourism industry, hundreds of miles of beaches and marsh environments, and important ocean ecosystems. For the sake of our beaches, coastal communities, and the significant boon coastal tourism provides to our economy, we, the undersigned local businesses, business leaders, are strongly opposed to drilling for oil off the Atlantic coast, and we are calling on you to remove any proposals to do so. Offshore drilling is incompatible with our tourism and fishing industries. When you drill, you spill, and day-to-day -day drilling operations resent in chronic pollution and the industrialization of the coast for oil facilities. Look no further than the, the devastation of the BP Deepwater Horizon catastrophe 
brought to the Gulf of Mexico's fishing, tourism, and wildlife to recognize the impact drilling would have here on the Atlantic coast. And it goes on. I won't read it all. Um, but yeah, over three dozen businesses from Georgia signed on to this letter. Um, and I would join in some of our other speakers today in urging this committee to take up H.R. 1041 and vote it out. Thank you. Thank, thank you. And you could uh, submit that letter if you'd like to the committee. Yeah. Okay. I'll, I'll print out the and we'll get copies, or it, it'll be available if any member wants a copy. Let's okay. put it that way. Uh, we have two more. Bill, and I can't read the last name. I'm sorry. Yeah. That is you. Okay. All right. And what's the last name again? Sapp, S-A-P-P. -P. Okay. And if you'll tell us who you're, if, if you do represent anybody, who you represent other than yourself. Mr. Chairman, committee members, my name is Bill Sapp, and I'm an attorney with the Southern Environmental Law Center. And I just have uh, one point to make, and that goes to the likelihood of oil being discovered off our coast. Um, if you could pick up the three pages that I distributed previously, they tell a story. And uh, I basically learned this story f at the Boehm hearing out near the airport. Uh, there was a gentleman there who's a geologist, one of their experts, and essentially he told me what is reflected in these maps and he did direct me to these maps. Uh, the first one shows the boundaries of the Georgia portion of the continental shelf. And as you'll see, it's a pretty small sliver when you compare it to North Carolina and even South Carolina. And the reason it's so small is it simply traces the borders of our country or of our state out into the ocean. And that's how it gets that way. The second page shows you the different, as, as Bohm calls them, the different plays. Um, and the different colors reflect the likelihood of oil being discovered. And again, this was a Bohm geologist explaining this to me. I asked him what the green meant that is out in front of our state. And he said that is the color that is the most it's most unlikely for there to be oil in that area based on the geology of the ocean floor. Um, I then asked him, well, how can you be sure of that? And he showed me the last map. He said, unlike a lot of other places along the Atlantic seaboard, there have been a bunch of exploratory wells drilled off our coast. And you can see that on the, the last page. All of those little circles um, are exploratory wells. And, and, and he, again, you know, this is just him talking, but he basically said the likelihood of there being oil out there is pretty slim. Um, and, and then the question is, well, if the likelihood of oil out there is slim, then why are we letting seismic testing and oil drilling, ex more exploratory wells off our coast with all the risks attendant with that? And then the only, the only thing I want to add that I don't think any other folks have, have made is, is just a response to um, Mr. Hopkins' presentation where he talked about how safe uh, oil drilling is. And I would simply like to, to let the committee know that the whole story is that since Deepwater Horizon w happened and all that oil came onto the shores of Alabama and Louisiana and Mississippi, a lot of, or I should say a whole set of regulations were put in place to ensure to the best we can that that does not happen again. The current administration is removing all of those safety regulations. So I just wanted to leave the committee with that knowledge as well. Thank you very much. Thank you. Pre appreciate you coming today.
We have one more, uh, one more uh, person on the list would like to speak. Let me make another little announcement here. I don't think any, probably nobody in the, from the public was actually here. Uh, we had a meeting. We've had a couple meetings. We had one last Thursday, I think it was. And, uh, of course, anybody's free to get up and leave and come back in any time you want to. But uh, last week we had, uh, we had a list of speakers, and at the end I had announced it was the last speaker. And at the end of that last speaker, it was like a mass evacuation from the public back there. And I, w I would ask you not to do that. Uh, I'm not asking you to. Uh, stay seated until we rise or leave, anything like that whatsoever, but just as a, uh, for, the, for the process and the procedure and to make sure that we can continue the meeting after the last speaker, which will not last long, <laughs> I can assure you. But uh, I don't think there's anybody even here from the public that was at that meeting, and I, it may have been because there was another group coming in, another, uh, another uh, meeting right after that. But uh, and here again, you're free to get up and leave and come back in, obviously, anytime you want to, but... If you would just not, if you just wait until the meeting is over as a group, I would appreciate it. And with that, uh, Nancy uh, Davies, I think it is. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. As the last speaker, I appreciate your previous remarks. Uh, along with the other distinguished members of the committee, my name is Nancy Daves. I be come before the committee to urge you to support H.R. 1041, supporting Georgia's coastal tourism and fisheries and opposing seismic testing and oil drilling activities off the coast of Georgia. Two years ago, I retired to Georgia after 22 years as a protected species specialist with the National Marine Fisheries, which is a component of NOAA with the federal government. During my federal career, I worked on many programs for the conservation of marine mammals, including the North Atlantic right whale, Georgia State Marine Mammal. Threats to this species, sadly, are many, including entanglement in fishing lines and collisions with ships. This last year was a particularly bad one for North Atlantic right whale numbers, as you've heard previously, um, at least 18 animals died as a result of these threats over the summer and, and, and spring. Uh, in spite of the many actions that are taken for this species, that they're taken by governments, by fishers, and the shipping industry, there's a lot of regulation that tries to protect these animals. Sadly, its numbers have decreased to less than 450. Another threat to this animal is noise. North Atlantic right whales follow a migratory pattern that takes them north to New England and the east coast of Canada during the winter months, to the warmer months, um, where they feed and south to Georgia and Florida uh, to mate and have their babies during the colder months. During these migrations, um, these whales are in constant communication with each other, using sound to determine where they go, where they find food, and keeping in touch with their families. High impact noise from construction blasting and seismic testing has been, known, has been shown to be lethal to marine mammals. But also scientists have found that exposure to low frequency ship noise also is associated with chronic stress in whales, <laughs> which can impact their ability to reproduce and suppress their immu immune systems. Simply. Put simply, if whales can no longer hear each other um, and stay in contact, then their breeding opportunities are lessened. If they can't hear from other whales that have found uh, prey species, they lose their opportunities to feed. If they can't find sufficient food, female whales can't gain enough weight to sustain a pregnancy. These cumulative thr threats may be the reason that so far this year, no whales returning to their nor northern habita habitats uh, have been spotted with calves. And I, I look forward to the DNR's uh, survey for this year, and I hope it doesn't have that bad news in it. I've spoken about the North Atlantic right whale, but please remember that all of these threats affect other whales, dolphins, marine turtles, and other species down to zooplankton. As you consider the benefits of offshore drilling, I hope you'll also bear in mind the direct lethal threats of exploratory and commercial drilling extraction and transportation of offshore oil and gas 
to the North Atlantic white, right whales and other marine wildlife. Please consider the threats of building infrastructure, such as pipelines and refineries, which are threats not only to the marine mammal and the marine life, but will also compromise the character of our coastal landscapes and our communities. I thank you for your attention, and I urge you to support H.R. 1041 to show your opposition to show offshore drilling in the coastal waters of Georgia and by passing this piece of legislation out of the committee. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you for coming. Thank uh, all of you who have come and presented. I think the presentations were all uh, very, very uh, informative, uh, educational, and uh, that's what we want to do was hear and, and learn today. We, I think we have a, a question. I'm sorry. Statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I, too, appreciate everyone's uh, pre presentation, but I recommend, Mr. Chair, um, that we may want to get someone from Kings Bay, Georgia. Um, they're probably one of our largest um, clients in, in, in Georgia, and with regards to uh, being a national asset, and, and as a retired naval officer, um, the last thing we want to do is to, uh, uh, in addition to the plethora of the uh, points that were already made, um, but not all coasts are created equal. There's a reason why the Navy select um, certain states um, offshore both on both coasts in terms of operations. I know we do a significant amount of things to protect the right well. Uh, we secure our sonar. So uh, I, I would love uh, for this body uh, to also hear from uh, the Navy as well. Okay, thank you. I think it's a good suggestion. Try to see what we can do about that. Thank you. Uh, anybody else from the committee have anything they want to add to it or, or uh, offer to us? Uh, you gentlemen? Uh, I've enjoyed. If, if you don't mind, I'd, if you'll come over there. I served on St. Thomas for 51 years. I've depended on tourism. It's been my livelihood. I had a gift shop down in the village for 37 years, and you can't imagine what tourism means to a business on St. Simons. Had a homemade ice cream and fudge shop down there for about eight years. So tourism is the lifeblood of St. Simons, Brunswick, Glen County, Tybee Island, and Savannah. So I just hate to see something to happen to our coast that happened in Louisiana, Florida, Mississippi. And uh, I weighed the option of not signing the resolution for a while, but after thinking about how much tourism meant to me in my life, I'd hate to see something happen to my background, I mean my uh, area uh, for the coast, the, the uh, uh, salt marshes, and how much it means to our community and to the state of Georgia. So uh, I did sign the resolution, and I would ask that it pass out of this committee. Thank you. Thank you for coming today. We appreciate it. Uh, I, I wanna, anything else from the committee or any other member here? Uh, I recognize you. What is it you'd like to say? I, I would like to address the Yes, you can address the committee. Here again, I may be the only one left when you do it. It needs to be, you didn't sign up, and I was asking you to be very, very brief. My name is Kimberly Smith, and I'm a committee. I've been a, a citizen of Georgia also, and I've worked with children and students who were begging to have jobs that were different in the industry and for educational levels to exceed. And the petroleum industry does allow for that to occur. And it does, that you can't make a statement and you can't assume that the industry is actually going to come and take over jobs in Georgia. Actually what happens is they exceed and they, they build into the university system. What you've just done with the film industry and you've built the infrastructure for the jobs in Georgia, usually the petroleum industry and oil and gas, but it's already here. Colonial Pipeline, EY Oil and Gas, there's lots of activity and in industry, and so I don't want to, I want to put Georgia's kids in the future to actually have the ability for a chance, and I can appreciate the, 
the beaches, I can appreciate the zooplankton. You can't say that a geologist knows where offshore is altogether because actually there's lots of theories in geologists and you can't actually say. And so I'm asking this committee to just listen. I don't think th in any way that there's a, there's a full education that comes completely with the industry. And so everybody likes to talk about what happens with every, with every natural resource, which timber is your natural resource, kaolin is your natural resource. Actually, you guys are already in natural resource governance, and there's a lot of rules from the federal regulation, from the state, and that they have followed for years. And so even before BP, there was a lot that, that has been followed. And actually, the president is very conscientious and has allowed a lot of free trade and a lot of the ability for the dialogue to happen. And I would ask this committee to let that dialogue happen. And so I can appreciate that we have a lot of coastal people here and we have our one gentleman here that has brought, but J Texas, other states are great opportunities that you can study and you can see. The LDC conference is gonna be here in Atlanta. I'd invite any of you to come because it's natural gas. You've already got all of these things around you. All of them are already around you. So I wanna break the fear factor that it's there's something to be afraid of because when I see and I've looked into the eyes and raised money to help Georgia's children have a better education and have those job job skills. I'm living and traveling through areas and have seen thousands of students that did not have the opportunity to make money and change their families' lives and future. And so if Georgia negates this and turns it down, you're turning down the opportunity for students to learn. So I just want to share that. I want to appreciate you being here today. And um, there's and to give this, this group a fair opportunity to hear other voices from the energy industry. Oh, this is a th thank you for coming. This is a uh, hearing. Excuse me, ma'am. Ma'am, I don't know if, if, I don't recall if you stated your name. Did you state your name? My name is Kimberly Smith. Kimberly Smith. You, are you representing yourself or anybody else? Today? I'm with the, I am I'm representing myself as a private citizen. Okay, well, thank you for coming. Appreciate it. Appreciate everybody who's come, and uh, I know some of you have come a long ways, and you still got long trips back home this evening or tomorrow. Thank you very much. If there's nothing else from the, we do have. I do. I do want to announce we're having a. Uh, we do have a committee meeting scheduled for tomorrow at two, tomorrow at two here in this room on uh, House Bill 426. And with that, unless there's uh, uh, anything else. Any objection? We are adjourned.